I'm Dr. Scott Masson here in, with uh, Paideia today with my colleague, Dr. Bill Friesen. Uh, for today's episode, we are discussing the great Anglo-Saxon epic Beowulf. Uh, we studied it last time, looked at some of the background, the manuscript details, some of the features of uh, Germanic uh, character and so forth, which we saw in it. Today, we're going to look at the poem a little bit more in more detail and really focusing on the central feature, which is the monsters. But before we're going to do that, we're going to look at uh, a somewhat maybe peripheral issue for many listeners, but which is important, which is the fact uh, that this is a poem and not merely a historical artifact. It's a very carefully crafted poem. I'm not an Anglo-Saxonist, unlike my colleague here. But my sense is that this is a very uh, well-wrought and carefully contrived artifact, and it is quite brilliant as poetry. Um, Bill, am I correct in that assessment, and could you say more about that? Yeah, you, uh, you absolutely are correct. We mentioned glancingly in our previous uh, episode that Beowulf was known as an important text by scholars prior to the time of J.R.R. Tolkien. But it was important to them for different reasons than, than perhaps it was designed for. Uh, it was important as an archaeological sort of a text. Uh, archaeologists and historians, linguists, even people who specialized in the history of uh, prosodics, that is to say the, the mechanics of poetry, found the text to be absolutely invaluable from a scholarly perspective. And it was dissected and it was taken apart and it was investigated and they, they, they traced its, uh, its history in a myriad of different ways. And Tolkien over at Oxford was reading the text and few people had a better ear for poetry in the 20th century than Tolkien. Uh, if you just read his work aloud beside a lot of other writers who are writing, uh, not necessarily academic work, but fictional work. So the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings and stuff that popular culture knows so well today, you'll immediately hear a deep, rich, subtle artistry to the sound play and the cadence and the syntax and the diction shifts in his own writing. But he was able to spot that even more uh, acutely in the text that he read. And this was one of the key texts he read. A lot of people also don't know that he was the, the chief popularizer slash discoverer of the famous medieval tale, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Yeah. But that's a, that's a different text. And his thesis when he came to Beowulf. Uh, he had a series of lectures which was captured and then later published, edited and published in something called The Critics and the Monsters. If you're the Monsters all, and the Critics. The Monsters and the Critics, sorry. Yeah. And if you are at all interested in Beowulf as a poem, it's one of the key pieces of reading. You have to read this. It's, there's no getting away from it. You have to read it. You have to understand it in nuanced detail. And his argument in this was that all these specialists were reading and studying Beowulf as a sort of a, a scientific artifact, if you will. When in point of fact, it had not been designed as such. It had been designed as literature uh, with the objectives that literature basically always ha has had. I've mentioned this before in terms of movera et ocera, to move the passions and teach the, the heart and mind. Um, but we find similar things going on in here. And he said, you really have to enjoy, enjoy Beowulf first and foremost at the aesthetic level. This is what is not being done and everyone's kind of missing the boat. And there's this incredible horde of riches here, literary riches that people are not tuning into. So what are some of those features? Well, you have to understand there's a lot of background social conventions which have been lost. We talked a little bit last time about this. We talked about, for instance, the loyalty aspect of it and, and the sheer scale or the sheer importance of loyalty in the Germanic imagination. We also talked about the very distinctive vengeance culture they found themselves bound up in uh, and uh, of course they had no they had lots of laws the laws would be regularly recited in germanic culture even into christian times uh, and this was how the laws were remembered they were not codified for the most part it is interesting to note that the first document we have that survives from the anglo-saxon period actually is a law code Nevertheless, they had laws, but they did not have an executive branch like what we would call a police force or what have you. Nobody enforced that. If you wanted the laws enforced for the interests of your own kin group and your own circles, you had to enforce it yourself. And of course, this brings in the vengeance dynamic, which we differentiated quite radically, even antithetically, from 
Southern European vengeance codes, uh, the vendetta. But the features of the poetry, Bill. Yeah, we've got a few things in here that uh, still need to be elucidated. One of them is this dynamic, and you encounter it a few times in Beowulf, of flighting. Flighting is, to use colloquial language, it's a form of trash talk which either stands in or precedes physical conflict, violence. And you see Unferth and Beowulf get into this. And it's turned into an art form in the Germanic world and particularly in Anglo-Saxon uh, literature. So what you have to do is you, you have to speak eloquently and even poetically this trash talk towards your enemy. And if it's true trash talk, as it were, if, you, if your enemy actually has done something for which he or she can be mocked and condemned and what, what you will, uh, then it's known as what I've just called it here, flighting. If it's not, if you're just making stuff up, you hear this in, you know, in, uh, unfortunately. It's just slander. Yeah, if you hear, see two guys getting ready to fight, it's a deep primal instinct to trash talk. And if it's untrue trash talk, then it's known as Senna. Senna is not actually an Anglo-Saxon word. Anglo, uh, it's an Old Norse word. We don't have the Anglo-Saxon word for this, but the Old Norse certainly made the distinction. And we see from the way they deploy it, it seems the Anglo-Saxons made this distinction as well. There's true trash talk, and then there's just made up trash talk. The true trash talk, delivered in poetic form, uh, was looked on uh, with a great deal of admiration. And so, as I said, Beowulf and Unferth get into this, and Beowulf does actually note, devastatingly, he ends his flighting attack uh, on Unferth <clears throat> and disposes of him by pointing out the fact that Unferth is that most unthinkable thing of them all. He's a kin slayer. He has slain his own people. Right. And we never hear the background of this. This is, again, one of these tales which is lost, but the audience seems to obviously know because it's a ta-da moment and Unferth slinks away with his tail between his legs. So there's that literary feature. We talked about formulae briefly, and we can't spend too much time on formulae here. Moreover, we'd risk me absolutely geeking out again. So uh, we can't have that. None of that. None of that. Uh, we also have this very curious literary tactic from early Germanic literature. It's called the kenning. Uh, a kenning simply comes from this, it's, uh, this verb, to know, to understand something. So there's a riddling aspect and a coming to understand aspect to the kenning. And what the kenning actually strictly consists of is one word which is not taken literally, and then genitively, that is to say as a possessive, um, there's a second word which is attached to it. And by looking at the attention and interplay between the two words, you figure out what the thing in question is in a way that enriches and illuminates that concept. Old English and Old Norse literature is absolutely packed with kennings. They're all over the place. Um, Hronrada, Whale Road is a, a famous one from Beowulf, and I actually read yeah. that one last time in uh, the previous episode. Kennings have died away more or less entirely uh, in modern English. Uh, one of the ones that exists significantly is Ship of the Desert. Uh, so when you're talking about a ship of the desert, then the first question it begs is what exactly is a ship of the desert? And some people can get this quite easily. Others have to scratch their heads and think about this and try to figure this out. So if you think of it, when we're talking about a ship of the desert, is there a literal ship? No. Is there a literal desert? Yes. Okay. So what is the thing that metaphorically is a ship of the desert? Uh, well, let's think about the characteristics that might possibly connect things here. Uh, a ship is something that goes on uh, long journeys over vast trackless wastes, in this case of water. Uh, it is something which carries something in it or on it. It is something that uh, occasionally encounters uh, places of refuge, islands and what have you out on the oceans and things. Is it a camel? It is a camel, correct. <laughs> you have guessed correctly. And okay. according to the ancient Germanic riddling game, you get <laughs> your head. And now, of course, you would ask me a riddle and of course I would risk my head. But yes, so you think of it, the camel also crosses vast tracts of, of wasteland. The camel also encounters islands of refuge out there in the form of oases. Uh, the very waters themselves can look like the rippling sands and dunes and what have you. True. The camel also carries loads uh, on its back across the desert. It is a cargo creature, just like the ship is. Uh, it uh, embarks on vast merchant ventures, as ships oftentimes do. So all these things connect the ship to the camel. And so by thinking about it, you would figure this out. 
Now, in the Anglo-Saxon tradition, a kenning never consists of more than two elements. But uh, later on, in uh, Old Norse sources, uh, Schnorri Stirlusen writes something called Hattatal. Hattatal gives you basically poetic craft according to the Vikings. And it's a very dry read. But one of the things he says in there uh, is about the kenning. And he says it can never go beyond five elements. So apparently they pushed it right up to five. And I'm trying to remember. But it's Germanic, so they probably... <laughs> just add words yes they love compounding and we haven't talked no we i think we did talk a little bit about compounding so this notion of joining things is very much part of the art again and uh schnorri's uh ridiculous example i'm trying to remember it off the top of my head here is which is the an infamous example what is it again? Well, in, in modern german a fallschirmsjäger is a paratrooper yes Umbrella and a hunter, yeah. Anyway. Yes, yeah, so you have this, you have Kampfjäger, Fleugen, Zeuger. You got all these ridiculous words in German, uh, which are just compounded and compounded and compounded. It's a very distinctive and very old feature of the artistry of early Germanic literature. Any other things that we would want to draw to attention? I, I want to get to the monsters myself. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, very briefly, we've got also standard motifs. Uh, remember. Germanic What's a motif, would, first of all? Motif is a, a central sort of a subject, and in this case, it's a relatively complex subject. So the usual distinction I make with my students is don't confuse themes with motifs. So often in, in high school and even in university, they're taught that the theme is the main subject of a text, and this is actually not true. It's simplistic, and it does the student no good whatsoever. It takes from the student a very valuable tool. Motif is a central idea in the text. The theme is the text's take on the subject. What is the critical take on the subject? So the example I often use is Othello. Jealousy is a key central motif in the text. But what is the play actually saying about jealousy? And when you ask that question, all of a sudden, a potentially vastly richer line of inquiry opens up to you. Here uh, in Anglo-Saxon literature, we, or indeed or by extension Germanic literature, um, we have a couple of uh, motifs that crop up again and again. And the artistry of the author consists in repetition of that motif from the rest of Germanic culture and variation on an understood motif. So the audience knows these motifs, but the author does something oftentimes surprising, shocking, and artistic with the motif. So what is the motif here? Well, we've got a couple that we encounter in here. One is the beasts of battle. That's the standard name for it and they will invoke the beasts of battle. And the beasts of battle typically are the wolf and the raven. Uh, when the wolf and the raven show up, trouble is afoot. Battle and violence and slaughter and entropy are afoot. And they will just make sometimes backhanded reference to them. There's a couple of mentions of this motif in Beowulf. And you see it reproduced in iconography, Germanic, early Germanic iconography all over the place. If you see a raven, that means, well, it means a number of things, but amongst other things, it means death in battle. Yeah. because the raven will devour the corpses and stuff and likewise the wolf same sort of idea there there's this notion of wolf and wolfishness which actually is connected to the berserker tradition uh on which i've published uh in neo helicon and uh the wolf of course again he shows up to take advantage of the dead bodies on the field uh, but he also brings his own ferocity and habits to uh, the battlefield so that's one motif, the beasts of battle. The other is this motif of exile. Um, and again, a very rich motif. And you see it hinted at in various places here in Beowulf. Clearly the audience is familiar with it, uh, but it doesn't hold a central position. It does hold a central position in other poems such as the wanderer and, and whatnot. And the notion is that you are a social creature. This is absolutely core to understanding. Along with the monsters, this is core to understanding Beowulf. Uh, people are people relative oftentimes to other people. And they pick up their value and their honor and their virtue and all these sorts of things in terms of the relationships with the other people. And sometimes those people are your fellow retainers, mm -hmm. your lord or whoever that might be. And we see that explored particularly with the famous Hall of Herod in Denmark, which is ruled over by Hrothgar, their king. And it has become a wonder in this northern world, this Mead Hall. Why? Because of its architecture, because of its decoration? No, because of its social bonds and the beauty of those social bonds that are manifested by the people who live in it and celebrate in it and what have you. And this is one of the reasons Grendel's attack on Heorot uh, 
and his slaughter of the people inside is such a, an absolute shock. Atrocity. Yes, yeah. it's a complete atrocity because it's an attack on the social bonds that make Hrothgar's people so famous, the Spear Danes, the Yardane. Um, well, I have to look at that because the, the author <clears throat> makes it clear why he is so angry at Hirot as well. He really does focus on the motivation for it, which uh, is intensely interesting, but I know you're going to get to that. Yeah. So those are the two main motifs, are you thinking? Yeah, about? That's, those are the ones we typically talk about, and, and for the most part, uh, that'll have to suffice for the time being. We mentioned also last class that, uh, not last class, I'm falling back into professor mode. We mentioned last episode also a little oh. bit about courtly and heroic love, and that bears a moment's contemplation as well. The idea of uh, in the early Middle Ages is that the most celebrated form of love in the literature is love uh, between men. And I mean that in the sense of the Lord retainer relationship and the other people with whom you are good friends with. So it's, it's, it's more than friendship. It's a lot more than friendship. I mean, this friendship is the kind of thing that gets tested in the face of nightmarish horrors uh, on the battlefield. Uh, it gets, it, it gets explored everywhere. And it builds up in this tremendous bond, this tremendous love between these men. And sometimes they're kin, and sometimes it's, like I said, it's lord and retainer. But this is the most celebrated bond of love. The sort that forms in man in battle, basically. Yeah, you see this even in, in weird ways. There's a certain point in Beowulf, where Beowulf uh, is obviously sitting at the feet of his lord, Hyalak. And he actually lays his head against Hyalak's knee. It's a very strange gesture. And it's just the sort of unconscious affection he has for his Lord. His Lord is his guide. His Lord is his protector. His Lord is, uh, to use one of their favorite words, his ring giver. He gives him wealth and glory. Uh, and he has a tremendous, deep, organic love for his Lord. In the High Middle Ages, that focus shifts to women in a very different form of love indeed called courtly love, an anachronistic term. Uh, but we'll talk about that in later episodes and explore that and what's uh, what's happening there. I, I think we need to get the monsters. Yeah. There are three monsters, first of all. Everyone knows that who's read the poem. Uh, Grendel, Grendel's mother, and then the dragon. And uh, the critics of the poem, who don't really see it as a poem, see think the monsters are rather poorly done, rather unimportant to the poem, uh, almost superfluous, and they largely ignore them. And as we said at the outset, Tolkien... Uh, in his essay, argues that the monsters are not only uh, important, they are central to the, high, to the entire poem, and they tie in with the motifs, which you've already discussed as bringing in the great themes of the poem. So the monsters really are at the center of the poem <clears throat> and what he's doing distinctively in the poem. Now, in the last podcast, we uh, noted that Tolkien said that this was not an epic uh, and that it was a heroic, elegiac poem. And he was probably speaking back against the Greco-Roman tradition that we had discussed previously in other episodes. And in that sense, he's probably correct. On the other hand, what is a heroic elegiac poem exactly? Granted that it has an elegiac tone to it, but this is not really an elegy either. Um, and it clearly has a hero, but uh, the, the cumulative effect of all of the features that we are going to know make it something like an epic. Um, in its scope and its importance, and particular in the way it, to my mind, it connects with the motifs that you discussed and, it, and the nature of the monsters. So let's, let's talk about the nature of the monsters because that's, that's key, isn't it? Uh, that's my sense. Yeah, the monsters to scholars, prior, I'm generalizing here, but uh, the monsters in general to scholars prior to Tolkien were, to sum it all up in one word, were an embarrassment. At one point, Professor Kerr, who is a contemporary, slightly precedes Tolkien and had held a formidable reputation in England as an Anglo-Saxonist, lamented the presence of the monsters. He says, you have yep. this ridiculous fairy tale superstitious element infecting an otherwise masterful artistic text. And uh, he, he lost no opportunity to disparage the presence of monsters in a text like Beowulf. Now, he was very sort of a positivist figure. Uh, in many ways proceeding from assumptions which are more proper to the Enlightenment, and we'll, we, perhaps we can come back to that. In any event, uh, he had a good go at Tolkien on numerous occasions because of this. So Tolkien had to fight back uh, against this notion here. Amongst other things, what Kerr was feeding off of in his disparagement 
was this notion which had been growing up, and we've talked about this a few times already, but here we can actually put some real meat on the bones, was a either implicit or explicit contempt for all things medieval. And that included their monsters, largely in almost sort of a, of a glacially slow process. We see a denigration of all things medieval uh, build up and build up and build up over the centuries of scholarship from the Renaissance onward towards these things. And so the monsters come directly under the scope, if you will, of contempt uh, by pretty well all the scholars who are studying Beowulf up until Tolkien. Just like, just like the miracles and the reference to angels in scripture, the same sort of, I think it's the same spirit at any rate. Anything that cannot be explained or understood by empirical science uh, is dismissed as uh, fanciful, irrelevant, fictional, and even mendacious, and certainly to be ignored as uh, something we need to see as a serious subject matter. Yeah. You see this with, uh, for instance, the cult of the saints. You see this with various uh, theological notions, which were held in the Middle Ages. You see it uh, right across the board on pretty well every cultural register. And literature is no different uh, in terms of coming under this, this withering contempt. Yeah. So Tolkien and his good friend C.S. Lewis were very much at pains and became, to some extent in academic circles, famous for actually recuperating to dignity a lot of medieval concepts by explaining them more realistically. Many of them had been characterized in forms, uh, in the form very much of a character, a cheap sort of straw man that uh, the modern scholars could uh, knock down and sneer at. One of the, the Such as in presenting them as psychological expressions or some sort of, uh, yes, religious, but in the sense of... Um, superstitious nonsense right? yeah and they, if they talked about medieval concepts spiritual aesthetic the monsters here for instance as they manifest in the literature if they talked about them at all they talked about them very much like a modern uh, anthropologist might talk about some primitive superstition held by a tribe in some place who knows and they're interesting as such but taken in and of themselves of course they're farcical and ridiculous and worthy of contempt Tolkien argued that there are actually some really, really sophisticated and complex things going on with the monsters. And moreover, the, a lot of the scholars who are mocking don't understand the monsters of the Middle Ages and in Beowulf in particular. What you see then is that you see a diminution of medieval monsters over the, the following centuries. Uh, so the elves become little tiny cute creatures to the modern imagination. You see like them, in Disney. Yeah, like in Disney or, you know, they sell you like cookies or something from the Keebler elves and whatnot. Goblins become these tiny, ugly, kind of cute little things. I think of the Rossetti's treatment goblin market and, and stuff like yep. this and all those sort yep. of grotesque paintings. And the goblin literally shrinks in physical scale and stature, as do the elves for that matter. They become tiny. Or, or in Pope's um, treatment as well. That's in right. Yeah, and that's very much in, in the spirit of post-Renaissance towards the medieval monstrous. You see fairies, they become things like Tinkerbell, when, of course, if you actually read about the original fae uh, in books like the Mabinogian and stuff like this, the fae are these terrifying, haunting, eerie creatures. You don't mess with the fae, the fairy. Likewise, trolls, a very common creature in uh, Germanic uh, literature, Trolls become these tiny, literally tiny little cute things that old women at the bingo hall put on their tables uh, to uh, incur some kind of luck or something like this. But there's literally a physical uh, as well as an imaginative diminution to the ridiculous. And now the English put them in their gardens. Yes, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> so you see this right across the board. And if you've read Tolkien, or even for that matter, Lewis, but Tolkien especially, Tolkien takes the goblin and reforms it into much closer to its original sense and spirit and stature, uh, first in The Hobbit, and then of course he does it again to some extent with the orcs and the goblins in uh, Lord of the Rings. He does the same thing with the elves. The elves become this highest of creation in that world, and they become lofty and noble and uh, and eerie and haunting. I'm going to ask you a question on this, Bill, and... You don't have to answer it now, but I want you to sit in the background and, and think about it a bit, or maybe you have an immediate answer. But aside from the work of good scholarship, which is recovering the ideas and the expression of them of past stages and not simply dismissing them because they don't conform to our own patterns of thought. So I think on, a level, on the level of scholarship, Tolkien and Lewis have done an inestimable uh, service to 
our age and helping us to understand previous ages. But beyond that, <clears throat> we're going to get to the monsters. And so as a scholarly endeavor, you'll say this is worth doing. Is there more something more important that's being recovered here in addressing the monster, the, the monstrosity of the monsters as they're presented? As I say, I'll just leave that question there. But why don't we talk about Beowulf or rather let's talk about Grendel? Because all of these, what, what's the phrase that's used of Grendel? He's God's ire bore. So he bore God's ire. That's a really interesting feature to Grendel. He's not just a, a troll. No, he's, he's got, not. There, there's more to him. And, and say, say something about that. The first thing that should be noted about Grendel is Grendel's identity is hard to pin down. I mentioned last episode that what Grendel actually looks like is almost impossible to say. We know that fire and iron don't bite on his skin, quote unquote, which is a phrase you always use for berserkers. That's a standard right. phrase. And I if see. I use that phrase about a certain individual, I don't even need to explain explicitly that that person is a berserker. He's a berserker. Everyone knows from the original audience. Tell uh, me something about berserkers then. Sure, because, uh, and we'll come to this in greater detail when it comes to uh, Grendel and his approach to the hall, a very masterful, very... Uh, He's also a descendant of Cain, right? He's so also, that's yeah. Picture. There is a book of the Old Testament, an apocryphal book, which still was in regular circulation in Anglo-Saxon Christianity in the time when this text was uh, composed, uh, the Book of Enoch. And the Book of Enoch talks about the Nephilim and uh, how these, uh, in some ways, are bound up as the kin of Cain, uh, the first murderer. So murderousness... Giants. Yes, they are giants. So is so within the Book of Enoch, there's, there's the Book of the Giants, right? Correct. And somehow it is implied... Uh, Grendel is related to these people, to the, this, this line of monsters, if you like. So he is a giant. He's also a troll. He's also, he's all these things. And you'll see this again and again in Germanic, early Germanic literature. They are not categorizers. And we mentioned this before. They're not categorizers like the later Middle Ages are categorizers. Uh, they're very much concerned with the spirit in which the monster moves. And sometimes a giant is more appropriate to that. Other times a troll is more appropriate to that. Other times uh, the, the wild danger of the berserker is more appropriate to that. Other times it serves the Beowulf poet to interweave all three of these things plus something else as well. Now, the kin of Cain and the giants and all that, uh, all that line, that kin group, have been wiped out in the story of Beowulf, except for two. And one, of course, is Grendel himself, and the other is Grendel, his mother. Mm. So this is key to understanding. And it is also understood that Grendel himself, he not only, he bears God's wrath, but his wrath in turn is turned upon men. The thing that makes him wild uh, in violence and hostility towards the Spear Danes and their group, their culture, their society, is the sound of their joy and their kinship and the friendship. I talked about this kind of love. Well, he hears this love in music And a form. light. Yes. And a light. And it echoes from this famous hall, this mead hall uh, of the Danes, built by their king, Hrothgar. And the thing about Herod as a famous hall is that it's not famous because it's big. It's not famous because it's ornate. It's not famous for any of these things. It's famous for the social bonds the beautiful social bonds that have built up amongst this band of retainers. Just and like we, King Arthur and his uh, kingdom, right? Like correct. Camelot. Correct. And he hears it and it makes him wild. He is, to come back to that motif, he is an exile. Grendel is an exile. He's exiled from society. All he has is his mother and that's it. Uh, there are, there's no music where he lives. There is no bonds of friendship and loyalty and love where he lives. He's, he's exiled from all these things. And when he hears it, echoing across the moors and what have you, this, this mirth, this, this love, if you like, entails, it should be noted. He's not just angered. He's angered to the point of homicidal, uh, destructive wrath. And we're going to see this again with the dragon, but in a very different and interesting way. Go back and, to the berserker thing, because I we didn't get to that. I don't want you to miss it. Berser How does the berserker fit in with this? The berserker is a figure which may long predate Germanic culture. Like we have even Assyrian and Akkadian accounts of individuals going into battle who carry the four features of the berserker. And I'm, I don't have time to get into those now, but they're very distinctive and they all interlock. 
And the notion is that the warrior in question who goes berserk opens himself up to the war god, in our case here, either Woden or Odin or whatever you want to call him. And Odin is the god of slaughter and war. Uh, very curious choice for the king of the gods. Uh, very unlike uh, the Greek and Roman pantheon where Mars, or Ares if you like, uh, is a god who is, he's the god of war, but he's not liked. And he certainly wouldn't be made king of the gods, unthinkable. Oh, indeed. Yeah. But in Germanic culture, yes, he is the king of the gods. Um, and Odin infuses the warrior with his spirit. And this makes the, it does a number of things. It makes the warrior wild with homicidal wrath. And it also means that the warrior cannot be harmed in battle. Iron and, and fire do not bite. And so you can swing your swords and axes and spears all you like, but you're not going to get this guy. The god is protecting him. This is why one of the reasons why they strip off all their armor. So he's and, a divine instrument. Yes, and uh, they strip off all their armor just to underscore the point that the god, not the armor, protects them now. And they'll go into battle completely naked. Interestingly... Beowulf, of all people, says, I'm not wearing armor for this battle with Grendel. I will not do it. And then he begins to behave in ways in the hall, and I'm going to read that later on, not, not at this very moment. He begins to behave in ways that are very berserker-like, uh, just as Grendel behaves in ways that are very berserker-like. And so when they clash, it's almost like a clash of these two epic berserkers. And we will see whose berserk power from a divine source is greater. He who is backed by the devil or he who is backed by God. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also a moral ambiguity. Germanic people don't necessarily like berserkers. It, towards the end of the Germanic period or the early Middle Ages, there are actually numbers of laws passed against people going berserk. So this was a real thing that really happened and they really didn't like it in Germanic culture. And this wasn't just, these weren't just laws being passed in the Christian period. There were areas which were still under pagan rule, passing laws against going berserk. So don't think that they valorized this necessarily. It was a spectacular thing. It was an aesthetic thing as well as a practical battle thing. Uh, but it was something they viewed with tremendous moral ambiguity. It's, it's problematic to go berserk, especially when that berserker can't control going berserk. And he goes berserk on the domestic front. And we see them explore this at great length later on. So Reed, why don't you read the text? Sure. I'll just pull this up. Because I'm, I'm very curious. So this is my translation, by the way. Okay. Then in the black night came stalking the shadow walker. The spearman who ought to hold that horned hall slept, all save one. It was known to men that without the desire of the creator, the sin destroyer could not drag them into the shadows. But he waited in rising wrath, watching, enraged for the foe, for the battle's outplay. Then from off the moor, under mountains of mist, came Grendel approaching, bearing God's fury. That was the line you gave me before there. The man-killer meant to catch one of man's kin in that high hall. He forged on under the fog until he could most clearly see the wine hall, the gold hall of men gleaming with ornament. That was not the first time he sought out Hrothgar's home. He never found in days of life, neither before nor after, harder fortune nor hall thanes. Then to the hall the warrior came creeping, cut off from joys. Soon the door, strengthened with iron straps, gave way when he laid his hands upon it. Then the one mindful of death ripped open the mouth of the hall. Now he was enraged. Swiftly thereafter the enemy strode over the glossy floor, went furious in spirit. From his eyes emanated a ghastly glow, most like flame. He saw many warriors, the sleeping band of kin, huddled together, a heap of retainers, then his spirit laughed. Before dawn, he, that grisly monster, meant to tear life from the body of every man, now that the opportunity for a feast meal for him had befallen. So that's Grendel's approach on the hall itself. Uh. And in a moment, they will do battle, Beowulf. The interesting thing here is that oftentimes, as we go on through that translation, the pronouns become more and more ambiguous. Who's waiting Who's, uh, who exactly is rising in wrath? Who exactly is swelling with violence and rage? Uh, it could be Beowulf or it could be Grendel. We don't know. Mm -hmm. But there's a danger here that Beowulf himself is going to descend into the realm of the monsters himself and sully himself with, a, with an air or a taint of monstrousness. And this is a, a trajectory which the author actually uh, amplifies upon and explores as the text goes on. Beowulf is not a clean hero by the time we get to the end of the story. 
is that because he's going outside the realm of the civilized outside of the realm of the boundaries of the city as it were not that there's a city here but of civilization in order to deal with the monster he has to like the batman become <laughs> yeah no this is the thing the, he hates as it were yeah this is very much to the point we have that old now i, I think quite weary cliche from nietzsche that he who hunts monster monsters must be aware lest he himself become a monster even his name the beowulf suggests something like this does it not is that is he not a monster of a sort himself yeah, the berserker, it's it's thought, the etymology of the name, and, and again, at risk of geeking out here, uh, the etymology of the name is is very controversial amongst scholars. Uh, some people think it means bear shirt, sarik is their word for shirt, uh, and then uh, bear is largely their name for bear. But So some people think it means bear of shirt, i.e. not wearing any clothes, therefore indicating that the god is in you and fire and iron cannot bite, so you are without a shirt. Uh, the other more convincing uh, translation of the name is bear shirt. We know that the bear is associated with going berserk. Um, so when we get to Beowulf, and this is Tolkien's point, not my point. Uh, when we get to Beowulf, uh, we find this strange name. You're not allowed to actually say the name of the bear. It's a sacred animal and it's dangerous to name the bear. You never say it straight up if you can help it. But here what we have is we have Beo, which is B, and Wolf which indicates not just the wolf, but all things predator. So what is the predator of the bee? Well, first and foremost, you can think of your happy-go-lucky, roly-poly Winnie the Pooh. Get him around, honey, and watch what happens. But in this case here, of course, it's not, not cute at all. This is the he is named after the predator of the bee, and the predator of the bee is the bear. And so Beowulf seems to be associated with the bear, and the bear is associated with the berserker, and the berserker, is, the berserker features are exactly what we see being elicited here in the darkness of the hall as Beowulf waits for his, uh, for his victim with whom he is going to do battle. And he shows these features uh, in other places as well. Here, Beowulf has the high ground. This is a vengeance battle. Grendel has been murdering Hrothgar's th thanes, and Beowulf is here to avenge them and to do justice. And he does so within the hall, as you say, within the boundaries of what we would very anachronistically call the polis. This is the realm of men. So here in the realm of men, the invader comes and Beowulf pays out vengeance, richly deserved vengeance upon Grendel. And in the ensuing battle, all of a sudden, another thing a berserker has is superhuman strength. Uh, beyond all believing, they can pick up giant boulders, they can twist metal bars. They, you can't stand against the physical strength of a berserker. Uh, here, Beowulf locks on to his opponent in the darkness of the hall and instantly Grendel knows he's been grabbed by something with superhuman strength. And immediately, instead of fighting, uh, he turns to try to flee, but he cannot. He is now caught in the grip of Beowulf and his superhuman strength. And Beowulf, if you haven't read the text already, spoiler alert, Beowulf rips the arm clean off of Grendel. And Grendel, howling, flees into the darkness back to his refuge with his mother in the mirror. So Beowulf has all the proper normal glory here that one would have in a battle. He is justified in this battle for doing what he did and exercising the violence that he exercised. This is all well and good. And the Mead Hall celebrates the uh, defeat of Beowulf, or not Beowulf, of Grendel. Grendel is clearly dying, bleeding out, as you might imagine. Uh, I did actually look into this, and it is if you're strong enough, possible to literally rip the arm off of a human opponent if it comes to that. Um, you looked but, into this. Yes, I looked into this. If you actually pop the <laughs> joint and twist that. in the right ways, you can actually get an arm right off if you're a reasonably strong person. But okay. that's, that's a distraction, a bloody distraction. So we're going to see that, as you mentioned before, understanding this text in terms of the three monsters it can be a really illuminating way to look at the text. And uh, this is, again, Tolkien's thinking on these matters. He said, you can look at the text either as a diptych or a triptych. These are these little folding panels. Sort of, yeah, they're panels uh, that a person in the Middle Ages would use to keep himself or herself from being distracted. They're oftentimes decorated with paintings of saints or prayers or things of this nature. Uh, a diptych is a two panel thing that you put up and you uh, unfold and then you pray behind it. A triptych obviously has three. And this speaks very much to iconography that would be very familiar to Tolkien. Tolkien himself, of course, was a Catholic, so this is, this is his machinery. And he said, you can understand it in terms of a diptych, in terms of Beowulf young and Beowulf old. The young Beowulf fights Grendel and his mother, and then the old Beowulf fights the dragon. And So that's if it's a diptych. 
That's if it's a diptych. Uh, if it's a triptych, of course, you're understanding it according to the three monsters you mentioned, uh, Grendel, Grendel's mom, and the dragon. And we're largely discussing it in this second model ourselves right now, and we'll, perhaps we'll stick to that and maybe bring in the, the, the bipartite uh, nature of uh, the poem a little bit later. Yeah, although we're going to need to move on with this. So yes, let's, of course. Let's, because otherwise we'll geek out and spend hours on this, which I know that you would do and I would gladly do, but yeah, yeah. I'd rather exceed our aims here. Um, so let's talk about the mother then. And he's still a young man. He's not, he's not uh, a neophyte by any means. He has accomplishments, but nonetheless, he has a bad reputation, or rather he has almost no reputation as Beowulf, or, and, or if he does one, it's a rather uncertain one. And he's forging a reputation through these deeds that he is now uh, doing on behalf of his kinsmen. Yes, that's, that's exactly to the point. Um, he is known for various deeds throughout his life. Uh, he becomes famous not only for what he does here with Grendel and his mother, but uh, of course in the, the raid on uh, the Hetvara in 530, the only historically datable date in the poem. Uh, but with Grendel's mother, of course, she discovers that her son is injured. He's dead. He, she has his corpse in her cavern. Her cavern, cavern curiously, is uh, located in a mirror or under some kind of lake type uh, body of water deep down and so it's in a, a grotto that you get to by swimming down to it and then you have to swim up and there's a pocket of air and what have you and this is where she lives and this is significant because uh, as, as the kin of Cain they should have been wiped out by the great flood which Noah survived and nobody else did no one his people survived and no one else did uh, so she's still under the waters of the flood. This is key to understanding the whole Cain strain of things here. And again, that's another thing we could talk about for hours, but we don't have time. And the sea in scripture, as time goes by, becomes more and more associated with the forces of evil that oppose God's righteous rule. So there's that element as well. That's right. And that in the Anglo-Saxon imagination, that's largely something they inherit from the Celtic missionaries who come across who have very much what you and I might term as an Old Testament view or, or a more old, old testament influenced view of christianity than the missionaries coming out of rome again different topic but having said that as the last of the kin of cain grendel's mother is obligated by vengeance codes to avenge the death of her son this is a must and why hrothgar and beowulf and the retainers celebrating back at the mead hall aren't aware that this is now a necessity and that they are in danger uh, remains to be seen. Is this an oversight and does some condemnation attach? I don't know, but it's it's a discussion worth having. Anyway, she revisits the hall uh, while they're all sleeping, or maybe sleeping it off, I don't know. She's not here to slaughter. She's not here out of an exaltation uh, and a delight of death and entropy and all these sorts of things. She's here because of, as it were, the law. So her ethical reasons for, for visiting the hall are far stronger than Grendel's. She's got a right to avenge. And that is exactly what she does. And, and notice how she does it. She just, doesn't just kill everyone and anyone. She locates Hrothgar's most, most beloved thane, Ashir, and she kills him. And as soon as she kills him, she flees into the night. And there's an end of it. Vengeance has been satisfied. And obviously the death, death of Ashira uh, traumatizes Hrothgar enormously, and it is decided that the last of the Kinnikane, vengeance needs to go back the other uh, way again. As I said last episode, it's the, uh, as W.H. Auden said, it's the only perpetual motion machine. So now Hrothgar and his people need to avenge. And that's exactly what they do, led by Beowulf. They go out to the mirror, they know where it is, they trace the blood. And then Beowulf does what he does. He dives into the mirror and he swims down, down, down into the depths. And he comes up, as it were, in the underworld, the realm of the dead. Remember, she's supposed to be dead and symbolically she is dead. So Beowulf has visited the underworld. Is this being directly influenced by visits to the underworld or that we see in the Aeneid or again in the Odyssey? I don't think so myself. No. That's just my impression. But I do think it's kind of a, a maybe a tendency around epic-like texts to be fascinated with this realm and heroes typically travel to the realm of the dead and there's an ocean of complex reasons why that might be and that's largely they don't only travel there they come back yes and this is common to initiation rites in primitive cultures where you travel to the realm of the dead as a young man and you come back 
as a man uh, and a proper contributing member of society. Shamanistic cultures, you mean, and so forth. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And again, it's something that, you know, uh, invites a, a long, complex discussion for which we don't have the time here today. Beowulf engages with Grendel's mother in battle. And, and he has a sword. Well, not initially. Yeah, well, yeah, he's got he's got the sword of all people. Uh, it was lent to him by Unferth, the right, rabbit. the man who was flighting him, who has yes. now lent him his prized sword. Yes, Hrunting is the name of the sword, and the sword fails him. It shatters on Grendel's mother, uh, proving underscoring a point the point again implicitly that fire and iron will not bite. Does that mean that Grendel's mother is in the throes of a berserker rage and filled with some kind of dark spiritual energy which protects her? Very likely very likely and the audience would pick up on that and beowulf had comparatively a very easy battle of it with grendel he grabbed him they fought and grendel had never encountered somebody with more divine strength uh, before in all his life and it's the last encounter he will have one more feature this time he doesn't go naked he puts on a male shirt to protect him correct which and it he does also yes it does protect him but he is overpowered by grendel's mother and he's going to die until he sees a great ancient sword on the wall. Uh, and this speaks up to another thing I haven't talked about, which is Germanic culture's love of the antique, of the long lost and forgotten. They are continuously contemplating these sorts of things. If you showed a Germanic warrior two swords, one of which was fabulous and beautiful and covered in jewels and gold and what have you, and another one, which had been the possession of some legendary king, which is old and rusty and whatnot, he'd grab the old rusty sword in a second. That's what he's going to go for. You can, you can keep your fancy sword over there. So here we have an ancient sword. Immediately, avarice would fill the heart of the audience. Must have that. And he, on its hilt, very interestingly, is an ekphratic uh, depiction of the flood and the destruction of Cain's kin. Do you want to say a little bit about ekphrasis? Or? Well, just that it needs explanation since it's yes. not commonly used today. So it's just a depiction. It's a it's a a portrait that tells a story, as it were. So there's one the famous uh, locus classicus for for this is Achilles shield. Exactly. Uh, Aeneas likewise has one. It's it's very common. So it's a it's a portrait that tells a story of sorts. And that's an ekphrasis, and this sword has one as well. Go on. Yeah, which depicts the destruction of the kin of Cain uh, and the great flood. And so Beowulf manages in his struggles to get his hands on this sword, which is on the wall. And with it, he finally turns and he strikes down and chops the head off of Grendel's mother, killing her. And so ecphratically and symbolically, the flood has finally finished off the last of those evil old Fascinating. beings who once great, stalked great. the world. Fascinating. Yeah. So he has been the instrument of God's vengeance, as it were, uh, against human sinfulness human sinfulness there to some degree and monstrousness as well and there. monstrousness human monstrousness yes exactly and that's of course where we're going with uh, this entire conversation notice that beowulf a barely won this battle he won the first one quite handily excuse the pun uh he uh won, won the second one barely barely by the skin of his teeth and with uh, dif divine intercession if you like there's the sword it comes physically yep. in the form of the sword which melts away, of course, after he strikes it off and the blood touches the, the blade because, well, there's a number of arguments for why this might be, but it is where Tolkien got the idea for the, uh, the melting sword blades that you encounter, uh, uh, the monstrous... The cursed blade. blades in the Lord of the Rings, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Also, his moral footing in this battle, uh, which he barely won against Grendel's mother, is much more questionable. She had no choice but to avenge her son. He, in turn, Beowulf had no choice but to avenge Ashira, who had been killed in vengeance. Uh, so now, is that something that is contributing to the devolvement of Beowulf potentially into the realm of the monstrous? Is that what, the venge is that what vengeance culture does? Does it make monsters and berserkers of us all until it's just an endless cycle of entropy and slaughter that never ends? This is something which is very interestingly explored uh, in Beowulf. Uh, the Great Hall of Herod will burn that society of men that was such a wonder and so beautiful you know, amongst all the tribes that were around the spear danes it goes up and it dies it's, it is destroyed all good things are destroyed in this it said that world. towards the outset of the the story actually yes. around line 200 it's not at the end it's said at the beginning yes 
So that's very interesting that he's already tipping off that the very thing that Beowulf is defending will one day fall. However great he is, whatever he accomplishes in his heroic endeavors, it will not stop the inevitable destruction of everything good. And this is something absolutely key to understanding the early Germanic mindset, is that the world is by nature entropic. It, all good things decay and pass. And everything that they do heroically is done against that backdrop. And nowhere is this more powerfully and dramatically communicated than with the dragon, which is literally the very symbol of entropy, this entropy that we're talking about. If you write good art, if you build great things, if you accomplish glorious deeds, the dragon devours them all in the end. And Tolkien was very much at pains to uh, get this across. And here we have to talk again a little bit of, very briefly about diminution again. The dragon is the greatest of all monsters. You mentioned that only two survivals of dragons in Germanic culture survived down to us, the other one being Das Nibelungenlied. They're not common at all, and they are viewed with towering awe and terror by the Germanic imagination. You literally can't get anything more epic and horrific than the dragon. When the dragon shows up, it's all over. But it's a rarity in medieval literature, yes. correct? Yes. And as we said before, the dragon, Tolkien was at pains to make this point, and this is a key point. The dragon in Germanic, the Germanic imagination in Germanic literature has less of a sense of a noun. It is not a measurable, tangible thing. It is more uh, adjectival in its beingness. It is a spirit in which the world moves, operates, and by which it is bound. As I said last time, the dragon is so vast that it's... It's a sleepless uh, malice. It's the lurking. It's what he talks about in The Lord of the Rings, this restless, evil hostility, which attains an incarnate form at times, but it's always there. Is that that sense? Yes. It's, and again, we have a progression of evil as we move along here uh, that Beowulf is fighting. Beowulf doesn't just fight monsters and the monstrous. He's fighting the evil that is bound up in the monstrous, and he himself becomes potentially tainted by that monstrousness. Grendel is a very sort of mundane evil when we encounter him. He is sadistic. He is full of malice. He is an exile. He is alone. Um, he follows few, if any, codes, uh, and he delights in the things he does is, is evil. And it's a very understandable evil when we encounter evil in other literary works. Grendel lines up with that species of evil quite nicely, the Iagos, if you like. Well, he's very human in many ways. In many ways, yes. He's the most human, in some senses, of them all. Uh, Grendel's mother, on the other hand, she is the evil of the law. That's what she is. The law demands blood, demands vengeance. Uh, does it feel anything? No, that doesn't matter. Grendel felt something about evil. He, he, there was a sadistic delight in his evil. Uh, his heart laughed when he saw his victims in that hall. Grendel's mother, she does not laugh around slaughter. Yeah, and in some so Grendel's mother was more like the Germanic notion of the law you talked about last time. It's, I am against you, and I'm not impassioned about it. It's just, it has to happen. You are going to get it. And there's no bargaining. There's no way of avoiding. It's coming. Precisely. You could argue that it is uh, the contributing spirit to much of the horrific stuff that has happened in the Germanic world uh, historically. So when the Nazis are doing the, are enacting the horrors that they enact, let's say with the Holocaust, it's not that they are driven by passion and hatred. Quite the contrary. They turn their victims into numbers and unfeelingly feed them into the furnaces. That's the nature of the monstrousness here. It's just, it's an obligation that is put upon me and I will fulfill it even if it is absolutely horrific and I won't feel anything about it. It's the old James Bond line, which everyone sort of glibly says, it's nothing personal. Uh, that's the problem with it. It's nothing personal. That's, a so that's what Han Arendt called the banality of evil. There's this impersonality to it. Which... Yeah. So there's no sadistic delight. There's no passion. There's nothing to it. And in some ways, it's more chilling than the evil of Grendel. Absolutely. Uh, and, and it fits with the modern bureaucracy in that sense. So that's, but yeah. we'll get, that's another topic and we'll get off topic there. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's the evil of the death camp. It's the evil of dehumanization. It's the evil of objectification. As Kierkegaard said, you know, the, the great danger of our modern age is that we uh, are uh, subjective about ourselves and objective about the other. And because we're objective about the other, we can do anything to them. Uh, we make just an object. an object, correct. Correct. The dragon is 
I think of it, and this is just my own language here, as a Nietzschean monster. He is beyond good and evil. So he is the creature, the spirit, the entity, which doesn't even acknowledge the reality of good and evil. Lawlessness. It is, yeah, it is just brute violence and destruction and entropy. And that's what drives him. Uh, you can't appeal to the dragon on the basis of good and evil. You could say to Grendel, you're evil, and Grendel would shrug and say, yeah, isn't it delightful? And you could say to Grendel's mother, you're evil. And she might shrug and say to you, yeah, but it's the law. Yeah, but if you say to the dragon, as it were, you are evil, he would say, I don't understand those words you're using. He is uh, is like the avalanche that comes down the mountain and wipes out the orphanage. Is that evil? No, it's just death. It's just the way the world is. And it's you can a say horrifying to the <clears throat> reality, inexorable, pitiless, impersonal, and utterly impossible to resist. Yeah, so how do you actually say to the avalanche you're evil? It's meaningless to say this. And yet, is it horrific? Yes, it is greatly horrific that we find ourselves in a world that doesn't speak the language of good and evil uh, and will kill us. This is a world that means to kill us. This is the great sin from which we run. This is the dragon. You know, it's really interesting, Bill. I don't want to get off topic here, but the uh, word theodicy, T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y, mm -hmm. uh, comes from Lessing. He discusses this, and it's in the context of uh, earthquake in uh, Portugal, I believe, Lisbon, and 10,000 die. And he, he's discussing this sort of evil, which philosophers call natural evil, but that's almost not, it's not a very good way of describing what you're describing here. It's, 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 it's an unnatural, natural evil. That's what is being discussed. There's something that's contrary to all moral rectitude, all notions of law. That's the, the sort of what they call natural evil is an unnatural natural evil or something that am I stabbing at the right thing here? Yeah. There's a huge conversation, very interesting conversation to be had. Alas, we don't have time for that, but uh, yeah, it's from the perspective of Beowulf, we're looking out upon a world and realizing it's going to kill us. It's going to kill us violently and savagely, most likely. And we find this horrific and the world is incapable of understanding our horror and the way in which we feel that, I mean, human beings are moral in sharp contradistinction to the world in which they find themselves. Uh, so much so, it's so vast and, and horrific and lamentable, elegiac to use the term, is this circumstance that they literally circumscribe their cosmology with the great dragon what they call the myth Yarth's Ormer in Old Norse, or the worm. Interestingly, this, this greatest of creatures becomes the most miserable and insignificant of creatures in modern English. So when we call somebody a worm, we mean this tiny little thing that wiggles yeah. Uh, yeah. disgustingly on the ground. They saw it as this towering figure that's going to wipe us out existentially. Uh, and how do you fight that dragon? Because that's what Beowulf is fighting. But he does so a little, a little contextualization. 40 years have passed since he had the two encounters as a young man, unmarried with no dependents, and defending his kinsmen. He defeated Grendel, Grendel's mother. Now, 40 years later, he is himself a king. And he decides to go in to face this dragon even though he doesn't have to. There's no, there's no obligation here per se. And there's a lot on the line. Now, Hrothgar will not fight the dragon or will not fight Grendel, he, he's, right? But Beowulf does. Uh, and the reason that uh, Hrothgar won't fight Grendel is partly because he's a king and, and dare not risk the consequences of losing for, for the sake of the things that he holds to be sacred. Whereas Beowulf does do that. Am I getting in the right direction here because now we have an old man representative of the king and representative of the of this the sacred things of the civilization in an immediate way in a way he didn't when he first was defending his kinsmen you also as a if you are a good king your qualities will attract good men and we'll see this in a very different rather celtic light when we come to the knights of the round table but it's an old dynamic, some would argue a universal dynamic, that if you are a good king and a good leader, you will attract great retainers. And if all of a sudden you have to go out and do the fighting yourself, 
one of the things that implicitly highlights is the fact that you don't have any good retainers who can actually go out and do the fighting for you, especially if you're uh, of advanced years, as Beowulf is at the end. Beowulf, by the way, we calculate he's somewhere around 70 by the time he fights the dragon. So you really shouldn't be doing this. So so what this points up uh, is that there's no one else to do this, or he thinks there's no one, sorry, he thinks that there is somebody to do this, and he takes his retain, a bunch of retainers with him. And as soon as the dragon shows up, the retainers bolt all save one. Vila. All save one. Yes, and note interestingly also, there's 12. 12 is the number of, of retainers that crops up again and again and again. And some people have argued very convincingly that this is because of the influence of scripture and the disciples and, and matters like this. Uh, and likewise, uh, that there's some kind of analogy to be drawn between the disciples abandoning Christ when he's arrested, all save one, and so on and so forth. Anyway, uh, another discussion we don't have time for. So there's that, which makes uh, Beowulf's final stand against the dragon problematic. All his good men turn out not to be good men, save for Bilav. Um, he's also abandoning his people. He's going to leave them leaderless. And the tribe known as the Swedes will smash south in his uh, absence and conquer the Yates. By the way, it's not and the Yates, it's the Yates. The Yates, and they, they will burn Herat. Right? Yeah, the, the Yates are either wiped out or assimilated by the Swedes. They were a historical period. They really exist, or sorry, a historical people. And they did exist, but they were destroyed by the ferocious Swedes who came down from the north. Uh, and what exactly happened to them were they all wiped out or were they some were wiped out and others assimilated we don't really know there are no records of these things um and there's another problem with beowulf going out he's defending the actions of a thief uh, another wanderer an exile uh, who steals yes. the cup from the dragon so it's theft that beowulf is at some removes granted defending now having said this well, even there the thief was there's some language of sympathy for the thief. He was pushed that way because of the injustice with which he was treated. Out of desperation, he chances upon this and he takes it. So it's not, it's almost accidental. Yeah, there's a chain. You see that uh, the, the killing and the violence with Grendel's mother is inexorable. There's no getting out of that vengeance code. Likewise, there's a chain of events leading to the thief stealing what he steals, and the dragon's just going to do what the dragon always does. He's going to destroy in wrath and violence. And so, in a sense, Beowulf's hand is forced, but that's not an excuse in some senses. This is his lowest ground yet, morally speaking, for going out and engaging with the dragon. And this time, he's not going to come close to losing. He will lose, and he's going to die. At the final battle in Old Norse, uh, in the Old Norse mythology, the Battle of Ragnarök, Thor, who's uh, sometimes associated with Beowulf in tangential ways, uh, fights the great Mithyars Ormer that we've been talking about, and he kills the great Mithyars Ormer that we've been talking about. But he is covered in poison from the Mithyars Ormer, and he walks famously nine steps and drops. Nine is a sacred number in Germanic culture. Likewise, Beowulf fights the dragon at the very end of his people, as the case may be. Uh, He slays, with the help of Vilaf, uh, the dragon, but himself is poisoned and lingers and then dies very much. So there are these interesting connections between quote-unquote pagan myth and Mm -hmm. Christian myth, if you will, which points up the fact here that one of the things that the Beowulf poet is doing is he is doing what Anglo-Saxons always do, He's assimilating stuff. Appropriating and use, utilizing, yeah. Yeah, and I've seen some discussions about whether or not this poet was actually a Christian. And I think anybody who's a serious scholar about this considers this issue settled. This is not controversial. Yes, this poem is fundamentally, not just on the surface level, uh, a Christian poem. I heard one comment uh, or read one comment where somebody said, no, it's just a bunch of later scribes imposing their Christianity upon fundamentally a pagan text. No, this is no serious scholar, whether he's Christian or agnostic or atheist, really would adopt that stance. This poet is looking back at a pagan king who he deeply admires, but laments because that king was pagan. And who knows what happened to his soul, the poet says at the end. But there's no doubt that deep down in the the fundamental structures of this poem, it is fundamentally Christian in its worldview and elegiac, I might add. Uh, at the same time you it's, it doesn't end triumphantly uh, as it were is that all we have to say on this for no, this good heavens no but that's well what, i know we, we don't have to stop it that's where I, I, 
for me, this is one of the more fascinating discussions we've had because I've been able to sit and listen to you talk about something about which you know a great deal. And uh, this poem is uh, obviously, I mean, I think anybody who hasn't read the poem but has read Tolkien's Lord of the Rings can see the, the numerous connections with his imagination and his, his work. Obviously, we already talked about him as a literary critic, but here as, a, as an author, of, of fiction um but we, we need to leave that off what are we going to talk about next time bill next time we're going to talk about speaking of assimilating we're going to talk about a text oftentimes overlooked amongst the anglo-saxon literatures uh the old english andreas uh which survives to us, us both in poetic form and prose form because there are large elements in andreas which seem to have very direct dependence upon the story of Beowulf at the language of level, at the language of motif, at the language of thematic treatment. Uh, there's actually a lot of concrete connections between those two things, as well as connections between other things such as Greek and Latin texts, uh, which have not been acknowledged prior, and also the Old English Anglo-Saxon liturgy, which seems to contribute a lot of the language into this. But you see a radical approach to this material and also a very distinctive Anglo-Saxon approach to Christianity as it tries to assimilate pagan heroism with Christian heroism in this most uh, confusing of all saints. Well, I look forward to that. All right, folks, this has been Paideia Today. I am Dr. Bill Friesen, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Dr. Scott Masson. Thank you for listening to us, and we will listen to you, see you, speak to you next time. See you then.